Hello, um, welcome to, to people who've joined me afresh, and uh, thanks for staying if you, if you were if you were here in the previous one. Um, so, oh dear, this is not going to work very well. There we go. Okay, so um, this is a talk uh, called Object Reorientation, and the the sort of idea behind it is that we're going to try and go a bit beyond the, the standard rules that you might already know, such as solid and dry, and instead look at how we can leverage the power of object-orientated design to write code which is both easier to understand, to change, and to reason about. I'm introducing some design principles and rules during this talk, but the important thing to take away is not a set of hard, fast rules, but a set of guidelines which you could use to help shape your code. The most important thing to learn about any rule in software engineering is not what it is, but where and when it will help you, and where and when you can safely break it. So, you might be wondering what the, uh, the motivation behind this talk is, um, what the, the motivation behind applying some of these techniques is. You know, if, if the code works, isn't it good enough? Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But for most code that you write, at some point in the future, someone, probably you, is going to be having a look at the code and trying to figure out what it does or how it does it. And we want to give future you, or the future developer who's, who's got to work with your code that you've written, a bit of a helping hand. By improving the structure of our code, we're going to increase our ability to change it and adapt it. And increasing the quality of our code means we can reduce the number of defects. I've, always meant, I've already mentioned solid as a design principle. This talk isn't really going to focus on it very much. But there are probably a few people here who haven't come across it before. So for their benefit, and um, for the benefit of everyone else in the room, myself included, we never quite remember what the, the O or the I stands for. I'm going to go over it very briefly. Um, so the first S is the, the single responsibility principle. Um, that, that's, that's the idea that every class or, or module within your system has a, a, single, um, a single thing that it does, a single reason that it might need to change. This in, this can, of course, be quite a large responsibility, depending on the, the layer at which that, that code module or, or class resides. Um, obviously, if you've got like a, a system module, it's going to have quite a broad area, whereas if you've got just a, sort of a small value object or something like that, it's got quite a small responsibility. I think one of the key things to think about here is that you shouldn't need to use the word and when describing what the class does. Okay. The O. O in solid stands for the open closed principle. Now, there are two definitions for this one. The first is the idea that a class or module can either be open, so that you can add new functions to it, or closed, if it is available for other modules in your system to depend upon. So you shouldn't change it if there are things that are depending on it. Um, the second, second uh, definition for the open closed principle applies to polymorphism the idea that you can change one, one class for another easily. That, that says that the interface of a, uh, of a module is closed to modification, but that you can change the implementation of those interfaces. You can provide alternative implementations of that interface quite happily. So the, the implementation is open for modification, but the, the external interface is closed for modification. The third, third letter in solid, L, the Liskov substitution principle. It's the principle that allows us to substitute one implementation of an interface for another. And you should be able to do so without affecting the correctness of your program. E.g., if you switch out a database implementation from, say, MySQL to, to Postgres, the method should still do the same thing. I shouldn't call a delete method on the MySQL library to delete a row, but expect it to update something in the Postgres version. That would be not very useful. The I, interface segregation principle. The idea behind this principle is to ensure that interfaces on a class are kept to a minimum. 
so that they only contain the necessary methods for what that class does. It's kind of related to the single responsibility principle, but for, for interfaces, for, for sort of contracts between codes. And the, the final, the final, um, final letter in solid, D, stands for the dependency and version principle. Now this is the idea that codes rely on abstractions, so to rely on interfaces ideally, instead of concrete implementations of something. That allows you to much easier switch out the, the implementation and means that if you change the implementation of something in your code, you don't then have to go and change all the consumers that are using that piece of code. Another oft quoted rule with a nice acronym um, is DRY. For anyone who's not heard of this before, it stands for don't repeat yourself. Okay, um, the, the idea that if you're keeping yourself, your code dry is to remove duplicated logic from the code. This has many advantages, such as reducing the effort to write and test the code in the first place. If you've only got one instance of a piece of business logic, you only have to write it once, you only have to write one test. It means you also don't introduce inconsistent behavior. If you've got the same piece of code replicated multiple times across your code base, say let, let's say five times, and you have a ticket, a task, which requires you to modify that piece of code, guaranteed all the time, every time you do it, you're going to get four out of five, you're going to forget one. And it's going to come back to you, and they're going to go, well, it didn't work in this situation. So you have to do more work to, to catch that fifth location. Now, dry is one of the rules where you really need to know where and when to apply it. Sometimes two bits of code may look the same, but they might have different reasons for, for changing. Um, an example of this I've come across in the past is a limit of items in a shopping cart. So there might be a limit that exists um, for how many items are from a promotion that you can add. You, know, you, you want to make sure that every customer that is visiting your site can take advantage of the promotion a little bit. So you, you put a limit on how many promotional items they can add to their basket. Another item might have a, a safety problem, you know, it might be something like a flow of gas or something like that. You're legally only allowed to ship in small quantities. So you have a limit, three items. You can't ship more than three of these in one go. Initially, those two pieces of code can't add more because of a promotion, can't add more because of a legal reason look the same. They both can't add more than three of this item in the basket. But they have different reasons to change. If marketing comes to you and says, you know what, our promotion is going really well, we want to allow people to order five items. So you go in and you change that, you, you've deduplicated that code, you've, you've abstracted it out, and you've called it an order limiter class or something like that. So you go and change it, you put in a five. You've changed it for your, your marketing campaign, but you've also changed it for where you had that piece of logic that was in there because of a legal compliance reason. So it's not always as easy to just remove duplicated code. You need to make sure it's, you're removing the right bits. Oh dear. This is going to be a pain. So, a bit of a question to the room, if, 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 if you're happy to answer. What do we think is the, the hardest the hardest bit of software development? Naming things, okay. Um, we're we're going to we have some hands up. So, so who thinks it's writing the code in the first place? Okay, so no, nobody finds that, that really difficult. What about, um, what about writing tests? Anybody think that writing tests for code is really hard? How about, how about naming things? Who, who, think, who thinks that naming things is really hard? Yeah, a few, few, few people. Okay. Um, Cache busting, yeah, that's a good one. Um, what about what about debugging code that doesn't work? You've, you've got something, you've written it, you think, yeah, that's perfect. You run it and oh, it doesn't work. Who, think, who thinks that's quite difficult? Uh, one, or, one or two people nodding their heads. Okay. Who thinks it's something else? Maybe I think the most difficult part of software engineering is, is nothing that I've mentioned so far. Yeah, I've got one, got one or two. Okay. Well, we're going to come back to this question question a little bit. Um, so, the first part of this, this talk, we're going to be looking at how we can reduce bugs in our code. So, th this is for the, the one or two people who think that debugging is, is quite hard. We're going to have a look at some techniques that might, that might help you with debugging your code. 
Um, I should point out that these techniques go hand in hand with good unit tests. Um, they're, not our, they're not a substitute for good unit tests, you'll still need tests, but they do sometimes help reduce the number of tests you need. You, you, can, you can use some of these techniques to mean that there are some tests you will not need to write because the code cannot get into the situation that you would need to test otherwise. So, the first thing that we're going to look at is to write code which reduces the number of possible invalid states. What do I mean by this? Have a look at this mythical service I've just invented. You can sort of see um, at the top there, we've got two parameters. It's Baz, it's Bar. Now, presumably this code does something further on down here. Um, but first of all, it sort of checks and makes sure that you've got either one or the other set, but not both. Now, the trouble with this code is there's two, two valid states, where one is true and one is false, and two invalid states, where, one is, where both are false or both are true. You can't have, have that, those combinations, which means that 50% of the time that someone just calls this method without sort of digging into it and having a look at it, they're going to get it wrong. It's going to throw an exception. So we could refactor it. We could make it like this. We could say, well, okay, let's, let's remove that parameter. And we could say, well, we know that it can only do foo or bar at once. So we, we're, going to, we're going to put a Boolean in and we're going to say, hey, um, if it's one, do one side of things, otherwise do the other. This has improved things. Okay. Um, now someone's going to call it. They can't provide those invalid states. But they've still got a little bit of a, a bit of an issue here. Which which represents foo, which represents bar? Do I pass it true or false? There's a little bit of uh, they still need to have a look at the code and try and figure out how to use the thing that you provided them with. So you might want to refactor it, make it look a bit more like this. Um, and so so instead of um, instead of providing two parameters, we've provided a single string parameter. And we're constraining the possible values by using class constants here. So we can take a quick glance at this function signature and the, the class constants, and then get a good idea of, of how they're supposed to use this code. They, they, they can kind of say, well, OK, if I wanted to do it with, with the bar mode, then I'll, I'll pass that, otherwise pass mode. And if someone reads the code without looking at this class and looks at where it's being called, they can tell what mode it's being called with, because it's right there, right now it's a class constant. So you made that a little bit easier for, for people. So the, the next rule. An object should always be in a valid state. Um, so I'll have a look at a code example again. The date range. This date range class, as you can see, um, we've got a, a start date and an end date. And we, we set the, the properties using a, a method. And at the bottom here, we've got this, this is valid, which, which returns whether the object is in a valid state, because a start date has to be before an end date. Now, the trouble with this code is, if someone's using this, you know, you've written this piece of code, you say, OK, well, we're going to use this to represent date range in our code base. Another developer uses it, and they forget to set the end date. And then they forget to call the invalid method. You've got an object which you're passing around your code base, which is pretending to be a date range, but it isn't actually a date range. So what we could maybe do to, to improve this, to, to make sure it's always valid, is we can say, well, okay, we're going to get rid of those setters. We're not going to allow those, those properties to be set um, individually. And instead, we're going to make sure they're always passed in the constructor. So we always make sure we've got two dates. Any time you've got an instance of this object in your code base, we're going to have those two dates. And we're also going to check that constraint that the start date is before the end date in that constructor so that you know that if you've constructed one, it's valid. It's always valid. No one's going to forget to call the isValid method on it. Okay? And if you do need to change the, the, the dates, you can call this update dates method, which you pass both dates at once. So you, you don't get situations where you have to set. You have to work out which one to set first to make sure it, you, know, you set both at the same time. You can check the invariant still holds and then update the state of the object. The next, next sort of trick, next rule, 
is to encapsulate internal state. Now, again, move on to, to a bit of a code example, the easiest way to explain this. We have an, an email address, okay? This is a, you probably handle email addresses all the time. And the, the idea is that if you have a look at this code, we've got sort of like, we've got this sort of continued on from the, the previous example where we said, okay, well, we're going we're gonna to put a constructor in place, we're going to make sure that email address is valid, we we'll do some checks, and we can pass this object around and we can guarantee that it's, it's a valid email address. Or can we? We've gone to all this effort to, to make sure the object starts off in a valid state, but we're allowing other developers to just alter things. Now, they might not realize that they're meant to do, they're only meant to, um, to alter this email address class with a valid email address, and they might take a perfectly valid email address object and change it and make it invalid again. So we can maybe refactor that, and get rid of that, um, get rid of that setter, and just make it read only. And we can make the property private at the top, which which encapsulates that internal state. And if you want to now change the email address, you need a completely new object. But you've made sure that object remains consistent internally, and that you, your code can rely on that object. If you get past the email address, you know it's going to be valid. You can send an email to it you know it's not going to throw an error. That's going to reduce a whole class of bugs of people passing empty email addresses to your email service and things like that. It's going to help bring those bugs down. Also makes it a bit easier to read. If you're just passing strings around, who knows what's in them? If you're passing an email address object around, you've got an email address, right? Anybody can read that and say, okay, the type in says email address, I need to pass it an email address. Next, um, next rule is to, to use type hints. Now, we've obviously gone to the, the effort of producing these, these objects which encapsulate uh, important values and make sure that they're internally consistent and make sure that the data inside them is always valid. We now need to use those. So maybe we've got this email sending class which takes a an email address for the, to send it to, it takes, um, takes a, a subject and a, and a body. And because it can't trust the email address, it's got to do this validation check here to make sure that it's a valid email before it sends it, so there's no errors. If we've got our email address object and we type hint on it, that's fine. We don't need to do the check. We know that it's valid. We, we can trust that object is a valid email address. We don't need to do that check. You don't need to write a test for it. If you can trust your object that you're passing in, you can just do the, the business logic that is involved in sending an email. Okay, That's going to make the, much less code there, so if someone's coming along to read that, they're not going to read through loads of lines of you saying, okay, is this a valid email address, is this a valid body, is this a valid subject? You've done that up ahead of time, you've separated that out. Single responsibility of this, this class is to send email, and that's what it does. So we'll move on to the next guideline. The idea here is to change the state of an object or return the value of a calculation, but never both. We'll have a look at what I mean by that. Let's have a look at a, a basket object, which maybe has a, a discount code um, applied to it. And we've put a method on the basket to, to calculate what that discount is. And as it calculates it, you know, we, we, we say well, we're going to we're going to give a 10% discount, pass that in, it calculates the discount, updates the total of the basket, and returns the amount that you've saved. So you can display it to your user and say, hey, look at this, you've, you've saved 15 pounds today, you save saved 15 euros. And then, you know, you, you use that in your, your view, maybe. And you say, okay, well, we, we, we're going to put we're going to put the discount in, and we say, okay, you saved, saved this much today. And then, um, your marketing guy comes to you and says, well, we, we want to add a new feature. We want to put like a banner across the top. We want to make it really obvious how much they've saved when they've shopped with us today. So why don't you put it in twice? Can you think what's going to happen if we call that method twice? We're going to apply the discount twice. So they've really saved a lot today. What we can do instead, we separate those two methods out. We have one method to apply the discount which you'd call in a controller, at the point which you decide, yeah, okay, this user's eligible for a 10% discount, but apply it. 
And then we put a getter which returns the value of the discount that the view can use, and then you're not continually reapplying this discount over and over again. Moving on to our next one. Be careful with mutable values. Um, this, is a, this is an interesting one. Um, code's maybe a little bit difficult to see if you if you're about there, but um, what, what, we've, what we've got is we've got a, a user entity. Okay, and the, one of the properties of a user entity is the date that they joined, um, the date that they joined your site. And we've got some business logic contained in this service class that says, you know, if, if the user's been a, a member for at least a year, we're going to give them a, a bonus. Okay, so this, this does some calculation. Can everyone see what's going to happen there when you save that user object? Because of the fact that a date time is, is an object, when you retrieve it from the user object, you get the date time, which is in the user entity. And when you add a user, uh, add a year to see if, see if a year has passed since they joined, you are actually modifying the value in the entity. That means that when you save it at the bottom after you've added their discount, their join gate gets updated. And a year from today, they'll get another discount. Probably not what you wanted to do. So what we could do is we could, we could change that. We could say, well, when we get the date time object out, let's use the date time immutable. We'll, um, we'll, we'll create a new instance and return that. That means you can do whatever you like with that object. I'm, I'm passing you an object, you can do whatever you like to it. It doesn't affect the internal state of your entity. It's a good solution, um, but there's a better one. We could do something like this. We could refactor it and say, well, you know what? The user entity, the user entity contains that join date. It knows when it joined the site. So let's add a method to the user entity to say, did this user join the site before a given date? So we add that up there. And then that simplifies our service because we've no longer got that logic of, you know, did, did they join before this date or, or anything like that? So we just ask the user entity, did you join before this date? If the user entity says yes, we apply the discount code and on away we go. So I said we would we would sort of get back to the the question I asked you a few minutes ago. What is the most difficult part of software engineering? So obviously debugging, testing, quite challenging for newer developers. But once you've been using a language for a while, once you're familiar with the tools, you, you, you get to kind of know these things. You, you're, qu you're quite familiar with, with how everything works. And you, you start to find that the, the thing that's taking the time, the thing that you're struggling with, is not actually writing the code, but it's understanding the problem that you're trying to solve with your code. It's actually talking to people in the business and saying, well, OK, what does this mean? What, what do you need me to do here? So if you start to reframe the task of writing code from one of implementing some logic in a computer programming language to one of very precisely encoding what you have learned from your business experts in the company about a specific problem in code so that not only the computer can execute that, but so that someone who comes along after you and has to make changes to that can understand the problem. You're saving them from having to redo all that work of talking to, to people. I know, I know some developers are not massive fans of talking to people. So you're saving them from having to redo all that. You're saving them from having to relearn everything that you've learned because you've written them a precise implementation in front of them and they can use that code to get a head start on what you had to learn. Okay. So this next section is going to be looking at ways that we can embed that knowledge that we've learned into our code. I'm going to do that using, if my slide will change, a case study. So um, a few years ago, um, I, I was working for a client who was in the fintech industry. Now. As they were a fintech company, they were handling money on behalf of their, their users. So it was, a, it was a discounting site. So you would sign up with a site, and they would give you a, like a, 
code that you could put into many online shopping centres. And you put this code in, and it didn't give you a discount off it right away. But what would happen is that once your order had been processed and gone through, a couple of weeks later, the, the retailer would give you a bit of cash back. And the, the fintech company in, in, in charge would, would take a small cut, and they would give you the rest. So you, you, you'd get a discount off all your shopping across, across loads of different online stores. Now, because of this, they obviously needed to make sure that these, these cashback deposits went to the right place. Um, and so making sure that they had the, the, uh, the right bank details for their customers to pay them, to pay them these cashback offers was really important. Now, this was a UK company, and a UK bank account consists of um, a sort code, which is six digits, usually displayed separated by two dashes. This identifies the bank, and usually a specific branch, so the, the, the city in which the bank resides. Um, and then you also have an account number, generally an eight-digit number, And this will identify a specific account, uh, the actual user account. Now, if I, if I give you that problem, I'd say, okay, well, we need to validate that <coughs> the, the details provided by our users are, are correct. You'd probably go away, and you'd say, okay, I'm going to write a validator. Um, and your, your first stab might look a bit like this. So we, we, we said, okay, we're going to take out those dashes of the sort code in case, in case the users put those in as well. And we're going to validate that it's a number, because all sort codes are numbers. And we're going to validate that it's six digits. And then we're going to have a look at um, the, the account number itself. And that will, will contain eight digits, also a number. And we're going to validate that. And provided that those, those are true, we're going to turn true and say, OK, your bank details are valid. Hands up if you think it was that easy. Good. OK. So it turns out that's not the only way you can validate a bank account. Bank accounts have what is known as a Mod 11 check on them. Now, what this is, is um, it's got each of the numbers in the, in the account, so your eight digits, and the six digits in the sort code. There are. Uh, 14 constants. And what you do is you take each number in the sort code and you multiply it by this constant and then you add them all together. And then finally, you, you take this, this number that you resulted and you take it modulus 11. And the modulus function divides by 11 and returns the remainder. So if it's not a full multiple of 11, it'll return, say, 4 or something like that. And the rule is, or, or part of the rule is that, um, that the, the, these rules, the, 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 these constants and these rules, you've got to do a model 11 check and it's got to come out to zero for it to be a valid bank account number. Okay? So that gives you sort of a check. If someone's flipped two numbers in their, in their bank account, it'll fail that model 11 check and you better reject it as an invalid bank account. You'll say, hold on, double check what you've given me, it doesn't look like you've got it right. And you know, your, your, your product owner comes to you and says, well, I want, I want you to implement this Model 11 check. And uh, yeah, you say, that, that, that's, that's quite easy. We'll, we'll write a function that looks a bit like this. And um, that's PHP code for, for implementing this Model 11 check. Um, but then you say, well, we've got all these constants. Where are they coming from? And the product owner says to you, well, well that depends. On what? Well, you see, I've got this file, and it lists all the constants and the the expected outcome of the, of the Mod 11 check. Because actually, not every bank uses zero. Some of them use one or or ten. And you're like, um, okay, okay. And they say, oh, and also, some banks don't use Mod 11; they use Mod 10. But don't worry, I've got this big big file of rules. Um, here it is. Uh, there's, there's also some other rules that some banks use 
because um, they, they use some additional rules in addition to this Model 11 check, and you can determine whether or not you need to apply these rules using the sort code. And you're sort of like, right, well, okay, well, this, this, this isn't quite as easy as I thought it was going to be. Um, and you sort of start digging into this technical specification. And uh, so, so this was a situation that I was in, this, this company. Now, there's a technical specification. It has clear rules. It should have been easy to implement, right? Well, yes and no. So this company had been, been going for a while before I joined it. And so they'd already had a stab at this validating bank accounts problem. And the previous developer certainly thought that it was going to be a nice, easy thing to implement and set off full steam ahead, implementing uh, a service to validate bank accounts. Now, they'd taken this, this huge file of rules, they'd passed it into a PHP array, and they'd used that array to look at which rules to apply in the sort of code, and then used a doubly nested switch statement to apply the correct rules based on, based on what they'd looked up. Now, this would have probably been fine if it worked. If you could have just left that piece of code and said, okay, we don't touch that. It, it's one of those things, we don't touch it. It works, we're going to leave it alone. Trouble was, a couple of weeks after I started, we got a bug report from customer services. They said, well, we had a few customers on the phone, and they're telling me that their bank accounts are invalid. And they're not. They are real valid bank accounts. We've double-checked. Um, can you make sure that they're accepted by the site? This ticket lands on my desk. I look at the code, you can imagine my reaction. Mm. Now, if I asked you to guess this huge service class, okay, thousand line of code, something like that. If I asked you to guess if it had any unit tests, you'd probably guess wrong, because it did actually have tests. It had two of them. One for a valid bank account, and one for an invalid one. Now, that, that was kind of like, well, okay, you, you, you've, you've, you've put some effort there. So what I did is I went and said, okay, well, let's take some of these bank accounts that are failing. I'm just going to add a new test for one of these bank accounts that fails. And, well, the test broke. Red test, failed. And so I'm sort of thinking, well, okay, what now? You're faced with a failing test, which is actually a, a bug that a consumer is, is encountering and is actually stopping them from, from registering with your site and making you money. And you've got this huge thousand line service class with no real useful comments or anything like that. Two unit tests which, which don't really help. What would you do next? Well, here's what I did. I wrote more tests. Hopefully, that technical specification, big, big thick document, had an appendix at the end, had a whole huge list of rules and sample bank accounts which both passed and failed the rules. And I was like, brilliant, this is great. I've now got 75 odd test cases. So I picked one valid and invalid for each one of the different rules, plugged it into a data provider in PHP unit and went, right, okay, let's see what happens. But a dozen of them failed. Oh. Right. Okay. What do we do now? So, I was thinking, right, could try and fix this code. Don't really fancy that. Could be here for a while. Let's refactor it and make it something a little bit, a little bit nicer. So, moved on. And remember those rules? We had about, about 14 different rules. Um, all of which were variations on the Mod 11 validation pattern. The sort code would, would determine which of these rules were to be used, um, but there were some instances in which the rule would differ depending on the account number as well. Um, there were also some instances where two rules would have to be valid for it to pass. So there, there, was, there was some mix and matching going on here. So what I decided to do was create a class which represented each one of these different rules. So here we have a, a rule class a rule interface and an implementation of it. So we say, okay, well, we're gonna abstract the, the implementation of these rules, and we have an interface that says, here's a bank account, here's a, here's a sort code, is it valid? 
and the rule would return true or false. Okay. Now, I then encoded each one of these rules as, a, as an implementation and could unit test each one of them separately. Useful. That would get rid of that huge nested switch statement inside the service class and gives an immediate jump in comprehensibility for the, the next person who's got to, to modify that code. Anyone who picks up that technical spec, reads through and goes, okay, well, there's these 14 rules. They have a look at the code base and look, there's 14 classes. Ah, correspondence. That's easy. I know something now. And they've not had to read through the definition of all those rules to figure things out. They've just gone, okay, that rule and that class. I can, I can ignore the implementation and can trust that that rule represents the rule of this technical specification. Okay. Wasn't finished there. Moved on. We're a change to the validator and had a map which mapped each rule to the, the class that it was going to be used. Um, replacing that huge service class with something much, much simpler. Um, the sole responsibility of this class now would be to determine which rule or rules needed to be run and running them to produce a result. Again, this reduces the knowledge required by someone who is picking it up. Say a new bank comes up with a different rule, instead of having to navigate this thousand line class with their nest, nested constructs, they just need to implement a new rule class and add it to the mapping in this class. I could have stopped there. However, part of my remit was to, to make this whole process much more robust because there was loads of instances where we were validating accounts across the code base and we wanted to try and reduce the number of instances where we had to do so. So, we moved on, we created a value object to represent our bank account. Now, if you were paying attention earlier, you'd have known that my, my preferred way of doing this is, is obviously creating a, a class which represents your value in, in, in code. And when we construct this object, we ensure that it's valid and take steps to prevent its internal state from becoming invalid. Um, I also added some useful methods to this, this class so you could compare it to other bank accounts and things like that. Um, which is quite useful. Um, so you don't have to sort of mess around with the internal state of your object. You can just go, does this bank account equal another bank account? Yes or no? Adding methods like that, quite helpful. And um, so one option when implementing this would have been to have that, that validator class um, do some validation. And then once it's done the validation, create an instance of this value object and return it. But if you remember, we were saying that we wanted our value object to own the value, the, the validness of its own state. So what we did, what I did instead was I created a static construction mechanism. Um, there were several, several valid ways to create a bank account objects. We're just looking at the, the sort code and account number here, but we, we also allowed people to use an IBAN to construct a bank account, and so you could construct one from an IBAN as well. Um, and, and what you do is you, you pass this validator object, the validator class that I showed a couple of slides back, into the constructor. That allows it to, to do the validation against all those rules, and that validator object completely abstracts away the need to load the huge file and, and do all the parsing and do all the rules, and it just returns a true or false. So now that I know, if I've got an instance of this bank account anywhere in the code base, it's been validated. So if I type int against it, I know it's a valid bank account. And again, we, we, we could probably have stopped there. Um, but I want to make it even simpler for people who, who had, to use, um, had to use this code. So we create a factory for them. Because I mean, they still need to know that in order to construct a bank account, they'd have to construct a, a validator object, pass in the, the, the file containing the rules, and things like that. So to help them out, I created a factory. What this factory does, it, it takes a, a validator as an instance, so you, you can put it into your service manager, um, and you, you, you can pass this factory in as a dependency to your controller, or, or, or form object, or whatever's constructing your bank account. And then all, all the developer has to do, if they want to construct a valid bank account, is pass in two strings, contain the sort code and the account number, and then this factory will take care of all the complexity about validating a bank account, return to that value object. That means anybody in the future, if, you know, if you're implementing a new way of getting bank accounts into the system, they don't have to know all the complication of that, that, that technical spec. They don't have to read any of that. All they have to do is know that they need a, a bank account factory, and it will create them one. 
and they can trust that it's in a valid state. At every stage, we've encapsulated knowledge in a layer of our code, and we've reduced the amount of information that another developer's got to learn about the system to be able to use it. Okay? So every layer hides more information behind it. Obviously, if someone needs to change the validation rules, they're going to need to dig all the way into it. But for anyone just dealing with bank accounts, they don't need to know all that complexity. So you've encapsulated that knowledge in the code, but you've abstracted it away from the developer that's got to use it. OK, and so, so finally, we move on to some conclusions. Um, I'm going to leave you with a quote from, from Dijkstra, um, a fairly famous Dutch computer scientist. You've probably heard of him. He said that the purpose of abstraction is not to be vague, but to create a new semantic level in which you can be absolutely precise. When we are solving a business problem, we are taking a potentially complex program, pro process from the real world, and we are building an abstraction in software which represents that real world process, a computational model which represents that reality. The more precise the model we build, the easier it will be for another developer to pick up from where we, from where we left off, be that someone else because you've left the company, or be that you in six months when the product owner says to you, hey, I want to change this, can you, can you, go, in and, can you go in and change this? And that allows you to build upon it much easier and, and solve additional problems. Okay, so all that work that you've done to learn about a problem, to learn that technical spec on, on how to validate a bank account, you've left that there in code, and you made it easy for someone else to comprehend layer by layer. Okay? And if, if you approach every problem like this, you're going to find it much easier to get, get new developers on board. You're going to find it much easier to get started in your code base. You're going to find it easier to review code um, if, if, you're, if you're doing code reviews. Because you've, you've not developed it, but you're reading it, and it's making sense. Each layer's uncovering more information about the problem that they've solved and how they've solved it. If you're easier, able to review code easier, you better spot bugs easier. Okay, so you're going to increase the quality of your software as well. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much. Uh. I've got on there um, my, my Twitter handle if you want to follow me, and there's a link to my blog, which has got the, the slides for most of my talks on. There's also an article on there, a blog post I wrote about a year or so back, that's got some of the some examples of the, the, the rules from the first part of the talk. Um, and also there's a, a join-in link if, if you'd like to leave a rating on this talk. All right, well, um, do we have time for any questions? Do we have time for questions? Yep. Do you have a question? Oh, right, test my throwing arm out. Ray, good catch. Okay. Um, you mentioned that a function should either change the state or return something. Yes. It should not mix it. Uh, what about if an object changes its state and returns itself for further chaining? <sighs> fluent interfaces. Well, hmm. so a fluent interface is it's not really returning a value. It's not returning something that's calculated. But I would advise avoiding them most of the time. They're quite useful if you're doing something like uh, use doctoring, as the query builder. Yep. When you're using, when you're doing something like that, or when you're using PHP, or, uh, PHP units mock object builder, and you've got something that, that almost reads like an English sentence, that's a good use of a fluent interface. If you're just returning it for the sake of it, you're storing yourself a slight problem there because if at some point you need that method to return something, you can't do so without breaking backward compatibility. So, generally, I would make your um, methods which change state void, return nothing. Okay, unless you are specifically designing a fluent interface so that you can write some code that reads like English sentences. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Great. Thanks. Anyone else? No. Oh uh, no. Okay. You're lucky. You don't have to throw it anywhere. Ah. Uh, yep. Oh. Jeez. Way there we go. Right. Uh, if anybody wants to ask any questions privately, I'll be sort of around in the in the sort of lobby bar or the 
the area outside. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for, for listening. <laughs>